Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending today's session. I will get started here right away, just giving uh, a bit of time for everybody to get in, get settled, and we'll get going. All right, uh, my name is Vicki Lightbound. I am the director for the Water Innovation Program at Alberta Innovates. This is the second webinar in the 2023 Water Innovation Webinar Series. I would like to take a moment today to respectfully acknowledge that we are coming to you virtually from Treaty 6 and Treaty 7 territory and Métis regions 3 and 4 in Alberta. I will highlight that the reach of the work and its activities influence and are influenced by all Treaty territory and all Métis regions in Alberta, not just those from which we are coming to you today. This acknowledgement respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and of all Indigenous people of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. For those of you not familiar, Alberta Innovates is a provincial corporation created to support research and innovation activities. We provide funding programs, advice, connections, technical expertise, and applied research services. Our scope encompasses the whole innovation journey from applied R&D through to commercialization and end use. This includes science informing policy and practices. The Water Innovation webinars share ideas and outcomes from projects funded through Alberta Innovates Water Innovation Program and highlight other important water initiatives within the province. I hope the session will provide you with some valuable information and spark discussion. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them to the Q&A box. We will try and answer as many as we can after we hear from all of our speakers, but please feel free to submit them throughout the presentations. There is a session chat box as well, which I welcome you to use. You can connect with other participants, but please keep your focus on uh, the presentation. With that, I would like to welcome everyone to Alberta Innovates Water Innovation Webinar. Today's topic is Next Generation Membranes for Industrial Water Treatment. Membrane filtration has long been considered a viable and effective water treatment technology that is capable of cleaning water to drinking water quality. However, membranes often come at high cost and can easily fall under industrial conditions requiring regular maintenance efforts and maybe replacement. Speakers will share insights into why oil sands operations operators are considering membrane-based technologies and dive into some of the latest research addressing the shortcomings of membranes. Today, you will hear from Tom Reinders, Technology Development Engineer with CNRL, and Motada Sadrazadeh, Professor with the University of Alberta. So I'll pass it over to Tom if you're ready to share your screen. And unmute your mic as well. There you go. We can see it now, Tom. Great. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the development of high temperature reverse osmosis for the in situ oil sands industry. Um, your um, mic is muted. Okay. Yeah, um, we can hear you again. Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, not sure when I cut out, but, but I'll just start from the bottom. So, uh, today I'm going to talk about, about uh, development of high temperature reverse osmosis for the essential oil sands industry. I'll start with the value proposition. Uh, why are we interested in this technology? And, and I think a good place to start to do that is to provide a bit of a refresher for the in-situ um, on the in-situ oil sands. So the in-situ oil sands refers to the part of the oil sands uh, sector where bitumen is recovered in place or in situ. It represents about 50% of uh, the production in the oil sands, but it, um, it's 80% of Canada's oil sands reserves. So 80% of the reserves are um, too deep to be mined. So how we recover the bitumen is steam is injected through wells, heating the reservoir, um, allowing the bitumen to flow to surface. And so what flows to surface with the bitumen is water. It's the steam that condenses in the reservoir. Um, so that water and bitumen flow to surface. We separate the water, treat the water 
um, and recycle it as boiler feed water to generate more steam. Um, that bitumen and the water is hot. That's important for later. Um, what's shown at the bottom of the slide is the two techniques that are used today. Um, on the left is cyclic steam simulation, stimulation or CSS. It's the older um, technology and then, then the newer steam assisted gravity drainage or SAGD um, technology, which, um, which is used for a majority of the production in the industry today. And I want to touch on GHE emissions as well. Um, so um, the emissions come from burning of natural gas and produce gas, which is produced with the bitumen. The burning of that gas in the steam generators um, uh, produces the CO2 emissions. They're in the flue gas in the steam generator stack. So what we do today is we, um, after the bitumen and water is separated, we uh, cool the water. It's cool to treat uh, to, to reach the temperature limits of the water treatment equipment um, that we use. It's then reheated and fed into the steam generator. And so it's this cooling and reheating that got us thinking about high temperature processes and led us um, to high temperature reverse osmosis. Um, the process that we're targeting is shown um, is shown here where we have um, high temperature reverse osmosis and the pretreatment running at above 100 C and the RO is paired with um, uh, hybrid boilers or more efficient uh, steam generators. And so I talk about um, the whole process because it's the whole process that leads to uh, the benefits. Um, and the benefits we see are reduced GHG emissions by 5 to 10% versus incumbent technology by efficiently producing high quality water to feed into more efficient steam generators. Um, we see a smaller plant footprint by adopting membrane technology. Membrane technology is inherently more, um, uh, more compact. And then we see lower costs as well. That's in part due to the elimination of cooling and reheating steps. Um, but it's not just that. There's, there's efficiencies throughout the process that lead to lower costs. So now I'll talk a bit about um, the technology. So reverse osmosis is a type of membrane filtration. This is a filtration spectrum that shows what can be removed or separated with different uh, types of membrane filtration, um, as well as uh, particle filtration. So if, starting on the right with particle filtration, uh, the name implies you can remove particles particles down to one micron. And then moving to the left, you have microfiltration, and that can remove um, down to about 0.1 micron. Then you have ultrafilters, then you have nanofilters, and you're starting to be able to remove some of the dissolved uh, constituents. And then you have reverse osmosis, which is the tightest of the um, uh, membrane filters. Um, it can remove, as shown here, aqueous salts or metal ions. Uh, it can remove about 99% of what's dissolved in the water. And we need that. We need the dissolved solids removal to um, generate high quality boiler feed water. The, the photo up on the right shows you what a spiral wound reverse os osmosis element looks like. Um, it, um, it consists of a membrane filter wrapped around a permeate collection tube, along with a lot of other material. There's, there's a feed spacer, there's a permeate carrier, um, all wrapped into that element held together with glue. Um, that design produces separate uh, flow channels for the feed, um, the permeate, which is the treated water, and then the concentrate or the, the waste. Uh, the waste flow, um, and this design offers a lot of uh, a lot of benefits. Uh, it offers a very um, small footprint. You can get a lot of filtration area in a small footprint. Um, 
it's lower energy versus other technologies that do similar things. So when you compare it to evaporators for TDS removal, uh, this is a less energy intensive process. It's suitable for relatively high pressure and um, high temperature operation, but commercially uh, it's limited to 70 degrees C. So um, we, we want to adapt this technology um, for our applications. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we want to adapt what's on the market today. Uh, the things that we need to de-risk, um, we need to identify thermally stable materials of construction. We want to operate up above 100 degrees C. We want to ensure that permeate quality is suitable for um, higher efficiency steam generation. We need to uh, come up with a treatment process which is tailored to our institute produce water and at the same time produces um, high, high enough quality water to feed into the RO. And then like any membrane uh, in an industrial application, it will foul. So we have to determine those fouling rates and uh, how to clean the membrane. So how do we get there? So we have a shared R&D program between Suncor and Canadian Natural and um, Veolia. We started back in 2015. Um, Emissions Reduction Alberta now um, provides funding. So we started with a focus on game-changing technology for uh, in-situ facilities. So, and we progressed into the development of high temperature reverse osmosis for operation above 100 C. So some of our current activities, um, we have a Gen 2 field pilot. Um, that's four inch element testing, including the pretreatment at 90 C. It, that's actually a different, different program. Um, it's merged to a certain extent with uh, this new initiative. Uh, it's targeting 90 C. Uh, the new initiative is targeting above 100 C. We have testing ongoing at the University of Alberta. Um, currently testing 1.8 inch, 1 inch diameter elements above 100 C using synthetic water. We have process modeling and estimating uh, going on, and that's, that's important to establish those benefits I talked about earlier. And when we do some testing and we get data, we feed it in to, uh, to our modeling um, to refine the model and refine our business case. Uh, very shortly, we're going to um, move to two and a half inch uh, element testing at Nate at a, temperatures above 100 C using both synthetic and produced water. And then next year, uh, we've got our pilot at the WTDC that's four inch diameter elements at temperatures above 100 C. So, um, in the same way that high temperature reverse osmosis um, didn't exist and we have to develop that technology. The testing equipment to test high temperature RO didn't exist either. So we've procured um, a test rig for the University of Alberta. It's suitable for testing uh, at temperatures up to 130 C. It's been spe uh, specially designed to do that. Um, flow rates up to 500 liters per hour. It's capable of testing a 1.8 inch, 1 inch diameter element or flat sheet membranes. Um, it was commissioned in 2021 and we're currently using it to uh, test um, 1 inch elements um, uh, using synthetic water. And synthetic water is that we, we create a water which matches um, the water of interest, the actual water from our facilities. Um, this is the NATE MCAP skid. It's part of NATE's um, Membrane Technology Acceptance Program, or MTAP. Uh, it's designed for operation up to 120 C. Flow rates about three times what the U of A test rig is capable of. Um, up to 1.36 cubic meters an hour. It can test either 1.8 inch, a number of 1.8 inch elements, or 
two and a half inch diameter elements up to 40 inches in length. It has clean in place capabilities to, uh, to do the cleaning process for the, me for the membranes. And there's also chemical feed systems uh, provided as well. It's been designed to treat our produced water um, so we can feed it with produced water or synthetic water. Um, and, it's, and it's not just for, um, uh, for our app. It, it, it can be used for any municipal or industrial nano filtration or reverse osmosis application. It can test at higher temperatures, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be used at the higher temperatures, um, similarly to the, uh, the rig at the U of A. So we've commissioned that in 2022 and um, already done some preliminary testing. And the reason we, we needed this equipment is so that we can take kind of incremental steps um, along the path to commercialization. We can do bench tests at the U of A, then we're moving on to smaller, um, uh, larger tests at Nate, but still smaller than our field pilot. And then uh, that allows us to transition to a field pilot. Um, we're increasing technology readiness along that path. We're also increasing scope and cost. So, so whatever we can test at a smaller scale will save us costs down the road with the field pilot. And I should mention uh, what we've got shown here, the Water Technology Development Center, that's a piece of innovation infrastructure as well. That's a purpose-built um, field piloting facility to de-risk water technologies. It's hot coupled to Suncor's fire bag facility. Uh, so we have access to live fluids and it, it allows us to accelerate um, testing of technologies at, at reduced cost and uh, reduced risk for all the partners. So um, we, we don't have data to share from the, um, those activities that I described that are ongoing or, or um, just about to start, but we do have some data from our Gen 2 pilot, um, specifically data from um, testing the pretreatment equipment. So the, um, the Gen 2 program is actually a, a separate collaboration. Um, it predates the initiative to develop HTRO for greater than 100C. It's a collaboration between um, Velia, Suncor, Canadian Natural, and ConocoPhillips. Um, Alberta Innovates provides funding, and they've been they've been part of the program since the very beginning. So what we've evolved to is uh, piloting at um, another uh, at the Suncor Mackay River facility. So phase one is complete, and that was the deoiling uh, field pilot. Um, we, um, and that's the information I have to share. Uh, we're, we're about as, as I mentioned earlier, just about to start the phase two, a pre-concentration field pilot, which is the RO. And pre-concentration is a word that's used here and it's used in the objective of the pilot because initially uh, we had evaporators as part of the process lineup. And the idea was um, that the RO would provide a pre-concentration step for the evaporators. But we've moved on. Um, we're less interested in a flow sheet that involves um, evaporators. Um, but that's, that's where the name comes from. So um, this pilot, this phase two pilot, allows us to de-risk some of those technical um, question marks that I talked about earlier. Um, we'll be able to um, determine if we can meet if the permeate, the treated water, can meet the boiler feed water um, requirements that we have, um, we'll be able to identify fouling rates and the cleaning process for that uh, to return the membranes um, uh, to their optimum operating conditions. The work to develop high temperature um, materials uh, has already been done. There was a lot of work done in part of Gen 2 uh, to develop that. And actually, we're leveraging the work that was done on those elements for our initiative um, to develop HTRO for um, greater than 100C. So this, um, this shows a pilot design. 
it's both both shows kind of uh, the process flow as well as the technology that we're testing at um, some of the stages. So we're getting water from uh, the separator uh, specifically downstream of the produced water cooler. Um, the first step is to apply chemistry to aid in oil and solids removal in the coarse um, deoiling stage. In the coarse uh, deoiling stage, we've got three technologies that uh, were reviewed, tested, um, and I'll talk about that, the results from that in a moment. After the coarse deoiling, we have advanced deoiling, and there we tested three different types of ultrafiltration membranes. Following that step, um, we go into the RO stage or the phase two pilot. What's shown is that there's a possible organics or silica removal step. Um, right now, we don't we don't have that. We'll go um, into into the high temperature reverse osmosis with um, ion exchange upstream. So um, the course deoiling was also called phase one A. Uh, like I said, we mentioned we we tested three technologies and we we tested three classes of technology. We tested an induced gas flotation, which is what's used in the industry today for deoiling. Um, we tested a centrifugal separator and a microfilter. Um, and and why did we need coarse deoiling? And it 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 just it was to reduce the load on the downstream membranes to make the whole deoiling process uh, more robust. What's shown here is the performance of the IGF. So it was, it was able to consistently remove um, over 90% of the oil. Um, there was a dip. There was a dip in the middle, and that's actually when the, the chemistry was turned off. So it showed the value of the chemistry step upstream of the coarse deoiling. Um, our target was less than 20 ppm in the um, treated water from the IGF and uh, we were, well, in, in the effluent from the coarse deoiling step and we were able to achieve that. So um, the IGF was the clear winner out of this um, evaluation. It, it met um, our oil removal requirements. It was stable, uh, it was efficient. Um, the centrifugal separator worked uh, fairly well. Um, not as stable. There was there's variability in its um, performance, and the microfilter really didn't work very well at all. Uh, there was a lot of um, operational issues, and we never were able to achieve stable performance. So after that, we moved on to um, trial the advanced the oiling technologies, the ultrafiltration membranes, and we used the IGF um, to feed. Uh, as, as upstream pretreatment for the ultrafilter membranes. So we selected uh, two ceramic membranes and one polymeric membrane. We used an aluminum oxide multi-tube ceramic membrane and a silicone carbide monolith ceramic membrane. Um, why ceramic membranes? They're, they're um, suitable for high temperature operation. They're robust. Uh, they provide a robust barrier to oil upsets. You can operate them at high flux and um, you can get um, long life out of the membranes as well. The polymeric membrane, this specific one was chosen because it's uniquely uh, hydrophilic. So we were, except, we were expecting uh, very strong oil tolerance. Uh, it's a lower cost. Um, it, could, it could provide a lower cost solution. Um, but in this application, the flux and the lifetime of the um, element were big question marks. This is a picture of the ultrafiltration uh, skid. Uh, it's always easier to get pictures of these things before you install them. Um, in this case, uh, this equipment was um, stuffed into a container and uh, shipped to site. So the best photos were before it was installed. 
Here's uh, the combined data set for oil and water removal for the ultrafiltration membranes. The, uh, the upper band with the black dots is the feed into the IGF. And then the middle band is the treated water out of the IGF. And the lower band is um, the water quality coming out of the membranes. Um, you have to graph this logarithmically because there's or, you know, orders of magnitude drop. In, in oil concentration as you move from one step to the other. Um, what's shown in the lower band, the upper, um, the up, the upper end is uh, 5 ppm, which was our, our target for the treated water out of the membrane. Here's some data from um, operation of the aluminum oxide UF membrane. So, um, this shows flux and transmembrane pressure. So flux being the flow rate divided by the filtration area and the transmembrane pressure is the pressure across the membrane. The upper line, the red line is our um, flux and the blue, blue lines of the TMP. Uh, so uh, we had an upper limit of 30 PSI, a max TMP of 30 PSI. So what you'll see here is that the pressure, as the pressure climbed uh, and hit that um, upper threshold, it was either membrane modules uh, either swapped out, we had three modules we were testing, uh, or it was cleaned in place to recover, um, uh, to recover the membrane, and that brought you back to um, kind of the initial operating pressure. So this, this work was done to establish the maximum sustainable flux. The optimum backwashing um, regime and the um, cleaning protocol was established um, before this test was done. And then that, that, um, that was, those operating conditions were maintained as we tried to identify the maximum sustainable flux. So based on our piloting, um, the conclusions were that all of the UF membranes, ultrafilter membranes, were able to meet our permeate water quality in terms of oil and water. Um, both the ceramic membranes were able to meet the target flux and the cleaning interval um, at a 95% recovery. It was, it was found the backwash flux was a key uh, um, parameter to maintain sustainable um, performance. The monolith ceramic was, um, it took a bit more to clean it um, compared to the, the multi-tube ceramic uh, elements. The polymeric membrane, uh, it didn't meet our target flux or cleaning interval and it was more difficult to clean as well. So um, the main, uh, the most significant finding from, from this pilot was that both the ceramic membranes were suitable for the subsequent um, phase two piloting, but the polymeric membrane was not. So as I mentioned before, we have phase two coming up uh, in Q3 of this year. Uh, that's, that's really exciting. It's, it's our first opportunity to trial the process lineup with live in situ produced water. Um, it's a, really significant step in de-risking the pretreatment effectiveness uh, to identify we, if we can meet the permeate quality and to identify fouling rates and uh, the cleaning effectiveness. And we'll be able to take we'll be able to take the learnings from this pilot for our next pilot, our next field pilot at the WTDC for operations um, above 100 C. So that's, uh, that's what I had to share with you today. And now I'll uh, pass it over to the next speaker and you can learn about all the exciting uh, work that's being done at the University of Alberta to develop uh, new uh, and next gen membrane materials. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate that and, and the perspective from uh, the industry and the work that's been done to date. It's really exciting to see the progress and, and the potential benefits. Um, Motada, I'll pass it over to you if you want to start sharing your screen. You're welcome to turn on your camera if uh, it's working for you. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. All 
right, we can see your slides. Uh, not in presentation mode yet. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, you're good now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Tom uh, explained the, um, the process and logistic uh, aspect of the high temperature RO project. Uh, my talk is mainly focused on material development and, uh, and fabricating high temperature polymeric membranes. Uh, let me first introduce my research team. Um, I established Advanced Water Research Lab in 2015 uh, at the University of Alberta. In the AWRL, we conduct innovative research on new membrane materials and processes for water treatment. There are currently uh, uh, two postdoctoral fellows, eight PhDs, and four MSc students working in this lab. AWRL is equipped with membrane fabrication, characterization, and process equipment. <clears throat> uh, UFA membrane research program started in 2011 with support from Suncor, ConocoPhillips, and Estato at that time. We purchased the first bench scale filtration setup and started SAGD produced water treatment using commercial membranes. Between 2011 and 2015, we started making our own membranes. Uh, in 2015, I proposed a project to develop high temperature membranes for SAGD produced water treatment to Suncor. The extended scope of work was developed in 2016 with the Suncor, ConocoPhillips, and Devon uh, again that time. In 2017, this project was transferred to COSIA and leveraged by NSERC under CRD program. In late 2020, we extended the scope to develop larger scale membrane to be used in 18, 12 inch spiral modules uh, under the COSIA and CERC Alliance program. Uh, the ultra filtration modules will be hopefully tested by 2023 at some operational systems uh, like Nate and TAP. We are planning to fabricate and test our uh, RO modules by 2026. As Tom explained, uh, in the SAGD operation, the steam is injected underground to facilitate the extraction of bitumen. The mixture of bitumen and condensed water is then pumped to the surface. Uh, after separation of bitumen and deoiling, the produced water is introduced into a train of conventional uh, water treatment processes, including warm lime softener and cation exchanger. These processes can remove most of silica and divalent ions uh, but they do not provide any treatment for organic matter. The outlet of water treatment scheme is finally recycled to the once through a steam generator or OTSG. There are some challenges in the current process. Uh, the high concentration of dissolved solids and organic matter in the boiler feed water or BFW uh, causes the fouling or scaling of the boiler tubes. So they must be cleaned or replaced more frequently which increases the operating cost of the uh, process. Also, if we can increase the quality of the uh, boiler feed water, OTSGs can be replaced with drum boilers, and therefore uh, we can increase the steam quality and water recovery. Uh, we believe that the conventional methods can be replaced with membrane processes to increase the water recovery, uh, water quality, and steam quality, and reduce the GHG emission and operating cost of the site. But uh, there are some challenges to using membrane technology in SAGD. Uh, first, the membrane can be fouled and scaled by silica, organic matter, and the hardness of the SAGD produced water. Uh, this reduces the flux significantly over time, and therefore, uh, chemical cleaning and backwashing should be done more frequently. Uh, again, this increases the operating cost and decreases the lifetime of membrane. Uh, the second problem is the high temperature of SAGD produced water. Uh, which ranges uh, from 70 to uh, around 150 degrees C. Uh, the commercially available polymeric membrane cannot tolerate this temperature. Uh, thermally stable membranes can reduce boiler feed water heating requirement. Uh, therefore, an ideal membrane for SAG produced water should have high thermal stability, uh, high anti fouling property, provide uh, high water flux, and contaminant rejection. Uh, the development of uh, such membranes for SAGD produced water treatment is the focus of my research project uh, with Oil Science Company under COSIA. 
please note that there are many uh, industries, not only oil sands, that deal with high temperature process stream. So the outcome of this research uh, project can be beneficial for other industries. A uh, brief overview of membrane technology. As you know, a membrane is a semi-permeable barrier that allows the passage of desired materials such as water and rejects the contaminants passing through. Uh, depending on the type of driving force for this transport phenomena, we have different membrane processes. Uh, the driving force can be a pressure gradient like RO. Uh, it can be a concentration gradient like forward osmosis. It can be electric field. Uh, difference like electrodialysis. And finally, it can be temperature gradient uh, in membrane distillation. My research focuses on well-known pressure-driven membrane processes, uh, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis. Each of these processes uh, can be used for a certain application. For example, for oil separation, we use uh, MF membrane or microfiltrations. For bacteria and virus separation, we use ultrafiltration uh, membrane or, or UF. For water softening or removal of hardness, we use nanofiltration or NF. And finally, reverse osmosis is used for water desalination. Membrane itself is the most important part of any membrane process. Uh, and among the commercially available membrane, thin film composite membrane or TFC membranes dominate the market. Uh, with more than 90% share. Uh, TFC membranes are typically used in a spiral round uh, element design. If you open one of these elements, you can see that the membrane, see the spacer and permeate carrier are wrapped around the perforated uh, permeate collection tube. Now, if you look at the TFC reverse osmosis membrane more closely, you can see that it has three layers. The top layer, which is the most important layer, and it's called active layer is polyamide with a thickness around 300 nanometer. The middle layer is a microporous support layer, which is in fact 40 to 50 micron polysulfone UF membrane. And the bottom layer is a polyester fabric, which provides mechanical strength to the membrane. In AWRL, uh, we make the top and middle layers. Uh, phase separation method is used to make uh, the microfiltration and ultrafiltration membrane, uh, which are also used as middle layer of TFC reverse osmosis membrane. In the phase inversion method, uh, polymer is cast on a suitable support and then placed in the water bath to form a thin layer of porous membrane. Uh, you can see that the, here the cross section uh, image of the phase inversion membrane. Uh, and it is asymmetric membrane. The top layer is dense and the bottom layer has micro voids in it. And uh, this membrane, uh, again, have an asymmetric structure with a denser skin layer and more porous soft layer. <clears throat> and uh, the top microscopy image of these uh, uh, MF and UF membranes show that we have visible pores on top of these membranes. Then we apply interfacial polymerization reaction to coat a very thin layer of polyamide uh, on this porous membrane. In interfacial polymerization, two monomers, uh, here uh, I call them MPD, m phenylendiamine and TMC, trimethyl chloride, react with each other at the surface of the porous membrane that we just created in this uh, video. As you can see, the visible pores of the PES support uh, are covered by the polyamide layer with the region value structure. Don't, you can now see the pores, visible pores that we had in the PES, uh, microfiltration and ultrafiltration membranes anymore after coding the polyamide layer by the interfacial polymerization reaction, uh, which is the typical method in industry to make reverse osmosis thin film composite membrane. This roadmap was followed to improve the anti-fouling properties and thermal stability of membranes. Uh, we started with preparing high-performance polymeric uh, MF-UF membrane using advanced polymer materials. Then we prepared high-performance polymeric TFC-NFRO membranes, nanofiltration and reverse osmosis membrane. Uh, after that, we prepared high-performance nanocomposite membrane. And finally, we modified the surface of these membranes by different methods like patterning. 
uh, we prepared various types of composite and nanocomposite membrane using different types of polymers and nanoparticles. The membranes that are found to be closer to commercial deployment and have a higher possibility of success in oil sands are selected for the next phase of the COSIA NSERC Alliance program. The high temperature tests were done at bench scale using uh, three generation of high temperature setups in AWRL. AWRL, Suncor, CNRL, and Veolia contributed to the design of these setups. The middle one is not only designed, but also constructed in the AWRL. Uh, all these setups are capable of testing flat sheet and spire wound membrane elements. We first tested the commercial TFC membrane to establish a standard uh, operating protocol for high temperature testing of membranes. Uh, as you can see, the flux of three commercial membrane decreased uh, gradually at 75 degrees C. So uh, less flux decline over time is usually considered as a criteria for thermal stability of membranes. Uh, so here we can see that we have uh, up to 25% flux decline at 75 degrees C for the commercial RO membranes. Again, you can see here that by the continuous operation at 75 degrees C, the flux reduced gradually over time. The cyclic test of increasing and decreasing the temperature also showed uh, flux decline over time at higher temperature. This figure here shows the research work that we conducted under COSIA to make antifouling and thermally stable membranes. Uh, in subproject one, we are currently fabricating electroconductive membrane using a novel nanomaterials like Maxon. Uh, in subproject two, uh, our focus is on the development of. Uh, I have to go back here, sorry. In uh, subproject two, our focus is on the development of the state of the art polyamide and non polyamide RO membranes. In subproject three, advanced nanomaterials such as TiO2 and nanodiamonds are used to fabricate anti fouling and thermally stable nanocomposite uh, RO membranes. And in subproject four, we are working on the fabrication of pattern anti fouling RO membranes. Among all these projects, the production of the new generation of TFC, the thin film composite, and TFN, thin film nanocomposite membranes, on the right side uh, can uh, improve the thermal stability and has a higher probability for larger scale production. Uh, so my today's presentation is about the fabrication of these type of membranes on the right. Uh, I will also briefly present manufacturing spiral wound membrane modules in AWRL. Since we might have uh, audience from academia, uh, I present some scientific aspects of fabricating thermally stable membranes uh, that might be somehow boring. I start with fabricating nanocomposite RO membranes using TiO2. The main challenge in making nanocomposite membranes is the aggregation of nanomaterials and their incompatibility with the polymer matrix. The non-selective voids at the interface of those aggregates and the polymer it reduces the selectivity of the membrane significantly. So uh, uh, in fact, if I wanna consider those aggregates in the polymer, they may cause rupture of the thin polyamide layer in TFC membrane. So we provide a solution for this problem by simultaneous preparation and surface modification of TiO2 nanoparticles. Uh, as you can see here are TEM and DLS, uh, transmission electron microscopy, and dynamic light scattering characterization showed my monodispersed solution of TiO2 in heptane. The nanoparticle solution was transparent. This is a sign, it's a good sign that shows that the synthesis of a small size nanoparticle, TiO2 nanoparticles around 10 nanometer was successful. So how we could do this by a biphasic solvothermal reaction uh, to make oleic acid surface modified TiO2 nanoparticles in heptane. Uh, I recall that heptane is the organic solvent that we are using in our interfacial polymerization reaction to make top layer of TFC membrane in RO membrane. In this technique, the solution containing uh, titanium isopropyl oxide 
oleic acid and heptane was first mixed with the uh, aqueous solution of triethylamine. Uh, the reaction occurred in the autoclave at 20, 200 degrees C, and the supernatant, the top uh, liquid containing the TiO2 nanoparticles capped with the oleic acid, was collected for IP reaction. Uh, TMC was added to this solution, and after the IP reaction, nano-sized TiO2 nanoparticles were interact in the polyamide matrix. Uh, we uh, synthesized four different types of thin film nanocomposite membrane with different loading of uh, nanoparticles and tested them. The TEM cross-sectional image confirmed the presence of these nanoparticles. So TiO2, you can see that on the top active polyamide layer. Water flux test, test showed that by adding more TiO2 nanoparticles, the flux decreased as compared to the pristine TFC membrane, uh, but, but remained stable, which is one of the characteristics of thermally stable membranes. Uh, for the pristine TFC membrane, we observed continuous flux decline over time. Uh, but in the TFN membrane, when we increase the concentration of the nanoparticles in solution, you can see that the flux is less, but at least it is consistent and stable. So uh, the rejection result also show that the uh, TFN membrane with the highest loading of the TiO2, like TFN4 that you can see here, uh, even has a higher salt rejection than the TFC membrane. This shows that non-selective voids are not created and we achieved a good compatibility of the nanoparticles with the polyamide matrix in the TFC RO membranes. Uh, these membranes are also used for WLS feed water treatment at 65 degrees C, and the performance was not decreased over time, and it was a stable over time at 65 degrees C. In a recent effort, we added functionalized nanodiamond to the top polyamide layer to improve the thermal stability. The TEM and XRD characterization of nanodiamonds uh, showed synthesis of very small sized and well dispersed nano diamonds. So, in this study, uh, to increase the compatibility of the nano diamond with the polyamide matrix and decrease the chance of aggregation, the surface of the nano diamonds uh, were uh, properly functionalized with the MPD molecules. So, why we are doing that, just again, I recall that MPD is one of those monomers that reacts with TMC form the reverse osmosis membrane. So we believe that if we have those monomers on the surface of the nanoparticles, they can contribute to the IP reaction, to the interfacial polymerization reaction, and they will have a good compatibility with the polymer matrix. And uh, these nanodiamonds, functionalized nanodiamonds, were then added to the organic solution. Then the TMC solution was added to this mixture. And the mixture was used in the interfacial polymerization reaction. We prepared four membranes, uh, TFC1, which is a pristine TFC, and TFN100, 200, and 400, which are made by the addition of 100, 200, and 400 ppm modified nanodiamond particles. Uh, SCM showed that the morphology of the polyamide has significantly changed by adding nanodiamonds. It shows that we have nanodiamonds in the top structure. And the TEM cross-sectional images show that the formation of thicker polyamide layer uh, by the addition of the nanodiamonds to the polyamide layer uh, was successful. The flux results show that by the addition of nanodiamonds, the flux increased and almost reached uh, the commercial Suez membrane with one big difference, uh, that the flux of our synthesized membrane were, uh, was more stable at higher temperature than the commercial membrane. The salt rejection of TFM membrane with maximum loading of the nanodiamond was more than the pristine uh, RO membrane and commercial membrane. And again, it shows a successful incorporation of nanodiamond in the structure of the uh, polymer. In another, another study, we, we didn't add any nanoparticles to the top layer. Uh, what exactly we did here, we tried to tune the chemistry of the polyamide layer by adding another multifunctional monomer to the IP reaction. Uh, we used three amino primidin or TAP, which has three NH2 groups. 
that can contribute to the reaction. So uh, our hypothesis is that, that by having more of those functional groups, you have more reaction and you have more crossing density of the polyamide layer. And, and therefore we have a higher thermal stability of the TFC membrane. So in the water phase, we had two monomers, not just one monomer, which is MPD, which is commonly used by membrane manufacturers to make RO membrane. We added another monomer, which is TAP here, a multifunctional monomer. And in the organic phase, we had one monomer TMC monomer. And the IP reaction has led to the formation of new generation of polyamide on top of the porous support, which is more cross-linked. The SEM characterization showed that the typical ridge and valley structure for all membranes was formed. But for the case of modified membrane with new monomer, the size of these ridge and valleys decreased. AFM results in the middle uh, also confirmed that the roughness decreased by adding uh, that new monomer to the uh, mixture. And TEM cross-sectional image also showed formation of thinner membrane, which could potentially increase the flux significantly. The permeation results showed that by adding TAP, that new monomer, the flux enhanced significantly and remained constant over time at 75 degrees C. This shows that one, one condition for thermal stability is met, yes? So the flux is stable. The salt rejection results show that uh, NaCl rejection remained constant for TAP modified membrane by increasing the temperature. These membranes are also used for uh, WLS inlet water treatment at 75 degrees C, and the performance was a stable at high temperature uh, at 75 degrees C. The final work, in this work to make uh, lignin-based uh, RO membrane, this is a novel study that we use lignin for making membranes, and we call them greener membrane. Uh, first, lignin was dissolved in DI water, then MPD was added to this solution. So after that, fabrication of TFC membrane is started by the uh, conventional method by soaking the PES support with MPD lignin solution. And after that, the TMC solution was poured on the soaked support to allow for the polymerization reaction. We fabricated three membranes and labeled them as M1, M2, and M3, uh, which contained 1%, 3%, and 6% of lignin and compared the performance with the performance of the lignin-free TFC membrane, which is labeled here as M0. Uh, I just compared the results of pristine membrane with membrane with highest loading of lignin here. The flux results show that by adding 6 weight percent lignin, the flux increased significantly at both 25 and 75 degrees C. Uh, it can be due to the higher hydrophilicity of lignin modified memory, as you can see in the contact angle results here. Uh, interestingly, rejection also increased by adding lignin. So we usually have a trade off relation between the flux and rejection in membrane processes. When you increase the flux, salt rejection should decrease. But by adding lignin, we could, uh, we could get this result, which is repeatable, that we could increase both flux and rejection at the same time. But the most significant result is that both rejection and flux remain stable at 75 degrees C for the lignin modified membranes. It means that lignin not only uh, improved the permeation properties of the membrane, it also improved the thermal stability of membrane. We have already developed gen generation three of the membrane casting machine to produce larger scale flats through the membrane. Uh, we can now make about five 18, 12 inch spiral valve modules of uh, MF, UF and NF membranes per day. Uh, we are planning to design generation four by the end of the uh, 2023. Here you can see how generation two membrane manufacturing uh, works. We can make large scale flat sheet membranes that can later be used for making spiral valve modules. Uh, we improve the tension of the roll to roll a coating system, control system, uniformity, and repeatability of fabricating membranes over time. You can see that we, we cast the solution 
on top of the uh, support. And then the solution goes to the water, phase separation happens, and it's not a noisy setup, of course. And, and then you can see that the white color membrane is formed on the other side, which is the UF membrane. It is a support for making RO TFC membrane, or it can be used for other applications like pretreatment of the SAGD produced water. You can see the size of the membrane that we can make now. It's a larger scale fabrication process. And after that, we have the rolling and trimming, trimming system to make the 18, 12 inch spiral wall module. And in this uh, process, the large flat sheet memories are placed between feed the spacer and permit carrier, glued, rolled around a perforated tube, and finally trimmed to make the spiral wall modules. And uh, the bottom picture on the right is our first 18, 12 inch spiral wall module uh, at the AWRL. Here is the list of all projects that we conduct at the AWRL. We, uh, we fabricate thermally stable membranes that I presented today. Uh, we are working in the fabrication of gravity-driven membranes for rural, remote, and indigenous communities. Uh, we work on energy harvesting from wastewater by membrane technology. Uh, we work on removal of emerging contaminants like PFAS from challenging wastewater, or microplastics, of course, is one of those emerging contaminants. Uh, fabrication of electroconductive, electroresponsive membranes, fabrication of green membranes like lignin based membranes, uh, manufacturing a spiral wall membrane element. Uh, we are going to move on to half a meter long uh, membrane modules by the end of this year. Uh, we are currently making 12 inch, uh, so, but, but we are going to go for the larger one, 21 inch membranes. Uh, another research work that we are currently actively working on is precious metal recovery from brine using highly selective membranes. Uh, we are working on fabrication of electro-spawn nanofibrous membranes for oil water separation, energy management of water desalination plants by deep learning methods, and designing next generation membranes by uh, deep learning machine learning methods. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the sponsor of our, our research. I also thank my students and postdocs uh, past and present for their persistence and, and, and for being excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matata. Um, really great information. It's uh, incredible to see where membranes are going that we're able to, to address some of their, their shortcomings so that they can achieve the potential that they have. We'll have to have you back potentially to uh, present on some of those other topics that you, you showed in your, your summary slide there. So the, the floor is open for questions now. We'll, we'll have a bit of a discussion. Please continue to submit your questions through the Q&A box. Um, I have a couple here that we'll start with. Um, so I'll give you a, a break, Matata, and we'll, we'll go to Tom. Um, what are some of the limitations involved in increasing the temperature? Why has it been capped in the past commercially to 70 C? It's um, it's capped at 70C because nobody needed um, it to operate at higher temperatures. I'm referring to reverse osmosis. Um, there just wasn't a strong enough drive um, to push the temperature limits. Um, now that we are working with vendors uh, and we're in some cases, uh, driving the development of the technology to the higher temperatures. We are learning that there are other um, industries that could benefit from the higher temperature operation. Um, hot water, sanitizable membranes for the food and uh, um, beverage industry is one. Um, they don't need quite the high temperatures, but they uh, there now, uh, there's now applications emerging uh, for um, membranes above 70 C, but they really there wasn't a strong enough pull from from industry for uh, for that technology to be developed. And are there any limitations as you're going over 100 C? You know, pressure starts to become a factor in the types of materials that you're using. Yeah, so. Um, you have to 
you have to identify like materials for the whole element, not just the membrane, but all those other pieces that um, that we were talking about. They all have to be able to um, survive and perform at the higher temperatures. The membranes have to filter the water. Um, the speed spacers have to um, provide that channel. The mermaid, permeate characters have to provide that channel for the flow. And so you have to, and then the glue has to work at those temperatures as well. And it's not just holding it together, but the glue has to be malleable enough that you can roll. You can imagine rolling these elements if they're super stiff, you just couldn't roll them as tightly as you need them. So those are the things that um, that were that needed to be um, overcome to find materials that could uh, be used at the higher temperatures. Thanks, Tom. Um, next question, I think, came in um, before you started speaking more to the um, the nano layers, Mutata, but. Um, the question was around adding nanolayers to membranes to improve performance. You spoke quite a bit to the, the thermal performance, but maybe I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to speak to the anti-fouling aspects of, of some of the layers. Yes, so the, t the top layer that you're adding uh, in the tin film composite membrane uh, is, the, is the polyamide, and it should be there. That tin layer uh, is in fact doing the uh, selective properties. Uh, if we can remove salt and other organic matter, dissolve organic matter and dissolve silica, it's because of the top polyamide layer. So it has to be there. Now, the challenge is, is that, that that polyamide layer uh, is, is hydrophilic, but it's not that much hydrophilic. So that's the reason that we have fouling or scaling of that top layer. And researchers are doing different works to improve the hydrophilicity of that top layer like adding some additives like lignin. And lignin is, you can find it is a bio uh, polymer. You can find it is abundant in the, uh, in the pulp and paper industry. It's free. Sometimes uh, it is cheap, I can say. It's a byproduct and it's uh, sometimes free. So uh, if you can add it to the top layer, you can increase the hydrophilicity of that top polyamide layer. And then uh, when you're doing working on water treatment, a thin layer of water is formed on top of that, and 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 or organic matter, salt, silica, and other things uh, cannot uh, contact the top layer, and it reduces the fouling of the membrane. So, if you want to improve the anti-fouling properties, uh, the work that we are doing is the surface modification. So, we we change the properties of the surface. We make it more hydrophilic or we make it more negatively charged because most of the contaminants in the water are negatively charged. And if you can make the top layer negatively charged, you have more electrostatic repulsion. So contaminants, they cannot attract to the surface. Or we can make the membrane surface less rough or smoother. So if it is a smoother, uh, we, we can say that the nanoparticles uh, or contaminants in the water they are not attached in the valleys of the memory surface and re reduce the fouling. So there are three ways to reduce the fouling, and all of them are related to the surface modification methods, improving the hydrophilicity or increasing the hydrophilicity, making that more negatively charged, making that smoother. And all of these properties are characterized by uh, contact angle measurement, surface charge measurement, and finally, atomic force microscopy to measure roughness. Thank you. You're getting really good at answering questions before I ask them. So the, the next question was around the properties of lignin that make it advantageous for membrane uh, manufacturing. So you touched on that a little bit, um, but if you wanted to expand on that. Yeah, so lignin uh, from the pulp and paper in, in Alberta and, and in Ontario has some properties which are amazing. So. Uh, we noticed that in the last uh, two, three years, uh, I wasn't part of that, <laughs> that lignin challenge that we had in Alberta, you know, this, but, but uh, I had the opportunity to get some samples uh, for my curiosity to see if we can make membranes by this, this lignin. And we noticed that, that this uh, lignin produced in Canada is different uh, from the other lignin in other parts of the world, like in England, in Germany, and, and we tested all of them. And they are more hydrophilic. And, and we call them sulfonated craft lignin. And when I talk to the companies that are producing this type of lignin, like uh, West Fraser, uh, pulp and paper industry, 
I noticed that they don't have any sulfonation process in the process, of course. And the, the reason that it is sulfonated is that, that we have some sulfon group and over time, when we are doing the aging and over time they're sulfonated and they're giving the lignin a very uh, hydrophilic property. And that hydrophilic property is one aspect of that lignin which gives the membrane more hydrophilic the hydrophilicity and of course more anti-fouling property. Another aspect of that lignin is that, that when we add any nanomaterial, when we add any additive to the membrane, it may cause rupture of the membrane. It may reduce the rejection. Uh, or it may even, uh, if, if we have a very small nanoparticle, it may even reduce the flux through the membrane. But this lignin, if you add any concentration of this lignin to our membranes, like uh, MFUF membrane or NFRO membranes, it, it's not uh, worsening the, the performance of these membranes. So we could go to 10 weight percent, 15 weight percent, and still we are getting a high uh, performance of the membrane. And at the same time, finally, because this lignin uh, has a higher molecular weight than the polyamide that we are making, by adding this lignin to the polyamide structure, we could improve the thermal stability of the membrane, which, is, which was the target of that uh, COSIA project. So lignin provides, in summary, provides uh, three properties, two or four, I can say. It is cheap, of course, the first one, it's not expensive, and we can, add, we can have added value uh, product uh, by adding lignin. Second, uh, it is green. Uh, so in terms of circular economy, it's really uh, important. Uh, in turn, it, it can improve the properties of membrane in terms of flux, rejection, and thermal stability. Thank you. That was a great summary at the end there. Um, so, so the next question um, is for both of you. You both touched a little bit on the commercialization and, and scale of where you're at with the, the research and, and technology development. I'm curious, um, what's what's left, do you think? When are we going to see some of these next generation membranes available and in, in commercial use? I, I touched that membrane part. I leave Tom to talk about the process part. So uh, Tom, you go ahead, then I will talk about the membrane part. Oh, OK. Well, <clears throat> we are. Uh, close to um, the end of our development path for high temperature RO for our industry. Um, and then it's, um, when is there an opportunity to deploy the technology? Um, we've always targeted um, the membranes high temperature RO for greenfield applications, so new build. Um, so um, not sure when those developments will will happen. So it would you'd have to well, I'm talking about new SAG D facilities for the uh, oil sales. Um, we are we are starting to look at, at um, more, more uh, brownfield applications or retrofits. So um, it's kind of, it's kind of a new focus of ours, uh, along with um, you know the industry partners and um, the the vendors we work with to look at um, what advantages for an existing facility could there be to de to um, deploy uh, HTRO and could we. Could we see some of those GHG savings uh, that I talked about for the new facilities? So, so that's um, that's kind of our focus now. Um, what you have to do, like, first you have to prove out the technology, you get it up to a high technology readiness, and then you have to establish a business case. And so that's 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 the path to commercialization. That's a really good reminder, actually, that it's not just about developing a, a good technology. You really have to understand that that business side, how it fits in with industry. And, and as you mentioned, both greenfield and brownfield, I think that's uh, a really important learning for um, not just oil sands, but other industry as well. So just just briefly on the on the membrane material development, uh, uh, MF and UF membrane are closer to commercialization, of course, and RO membranes uh, we, we need to spend more time on that. So uh, I, I believe you have an MF membrane. If you are going to use them as the uh, pretreatment, uh, we can make uh, 8 to 12 and, or half a meter long 
uh, very soon, but are always challenging. So we are working on that, on the commercialization aspect. So we have one last question here, unless something else uh, comes in. So um, either of you could probably take this one. Do we have membrane technologies that can remove microplastics from industrial process water um, and or rivers? So uh, if I want to start here, so yeah, the microplastic and, and I would consider that as emerging contaminants. So uh, uh, emerging contaminants are, uh, has three main categories. Yeah, pharmaceutical, wastewater, uh, PFAS, uh, fluorinated compounds, and microplastic. And the main challenge in, this, uh, in these emerging contaminants is that their concentration in water bodies uh, is very low. So, uh, so if you want to use, for example, if you want to use advanced oxidation methods uh, for treatment of the uh, water containing emerging contaminants, the kinetic of the reaction was, will be very low because uh, oxidation material, if it's a chemical oxidation, if it's a, uh, a electro oxidation or any, if it's, if it's a phantom, the oxidants cannot target the contaminants because their concentration is very low and they cannot find it. They, they don't have any contact. So, and that's the reason that the kinetic of reaction is very low. And this is the main challenge. What exactly, how the membrane can help and what exactly we are doing in AWRL is dewatering. So we have some methods for, uh, for dewatering the this, this solution that has microplastics or pharmaceuticals uh, or PFAS. So the concentration of these materials from PPB level uh, increases to the PPM level. For example, if you have 10 PPB microplastic in the water resource, if we increase it to 100 ppm by removing the water from the solution by methods like forward osmosis or membrane distillation, we can have a higher concentration and we can use advanced oxidation methods. In summary, membrane alone cannot work. It should be a hybrid process. So you can concentrate the solution by membranes uh, like reverse osmosis, membrane distillation, forward osmosis, and after that, we have to use, again, advanced oxidation methods to degrade these contaminants. Great, thank you. And, and I don't see any other questions coming in, so I'll, I'll close things out here. Uh, big thank you to both Matad and Tom for your, your time today and, and sharing with us. Thank you for all those that have attended. Um, this session has been recorded. We'll, we'll send an email out when um, it is available for viewing. And keep an eye on your uh, emails for future sessions plan. We're taking a break over the summer, but should be coming back fall um, with a, a new topic for everybody to share. We look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.